So in the uh, previous two videos, and this is going to be the third and final video on the whole my physics PhD thing. Uh, in the first one, I talked about how to get there. In the second one, I talked about the courses and uh, getting to the point where you're going to start doing your research and you're going to have an you have an advisor. Uh, this is the final one where really I get down to the business of those really like three, uh, three and a half last years of the five where I had an advisor and then he assigned me a thesis topic and then I worked on it at a particle accelerator uh, where uh, they did B physics, B meson physics. And so I've uh, got a few points here and hopefully I won't be too long winded. Uh, if you got any comments, any ideas of what I should, uh, what I missed, I'll try to hit it in the comments. If there is room for a fourth video, maybe there is. I'm not sure that there is. I could always rant about string theory. That is true. How much I think is a waste of time. Uh, but anyways, so uh, so you have an advisor. Okay, you you go to your advisor and they give you a topic. They're gonna give you a topic. You have no idea what it is. You're not a researcher in the field. Uh, for 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, PhD candidates take that topic, go back, start researching it, keep going back to the advisor, and this back and forth over the years, and then you get to the point where you've done enough, uh, you write it up, you uh, present it, you, you do a defense, a thesis defense, and then you graduate. In my case, it was a little different because when my advisor handed me uh, the topic, it was what's called an exclusive reconstruction of a B meson, meaning I was going to reconstruct all the little particles that the B meson decayed to. If you think of the B meson as a dollar, and then that dollar is broken up into like a 50 cent piece, two quarters, but then that quarter breaks off into two dimes and a nickel, that sort of thing. Okay, so you, uh, but when you, when somebody gives you one of these modes, of course, nobody uh, probably who's watching this will care for that, those details. Uh, somebody gives you a topic, let's just call it a topic. If you see that the topic, in my case, I saw it, I was like, this is going to be pretty difficult. The mode of the B meson that I was assigned had uh, an anti neutron uh, and couldn't, you could only reconstruct one of the, mo the sub modes because every mode in particle physics has two modes the particles and some, some combination of particles and antiparticles, and then the opposite of those. So if you have a proton in a mode, the, uh, the other mode is going to be the one with the antiproton. If you have a pi plus, a pi m plus in this mode, the conjugate mode is going to have a pi minus. So you get, you, get, you get two modes, really, that you're reconstructing together to make the big mode. But if you've got an antineutron, the neutron is impossible to reconstruct as it just was not detected well, was not measured well in that, in that uh, 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 detector and so I had half a mode so I said hey how about I reconstruct a mode like it that has all charged particles as well so effectively I doubled the work but I wanted to make sure that if I saw the anti-neutron mode that it was really there because you can you have you can have two scenarios in your research especially when it's experimental that you don't want you don't want to find something that is not there or you want to, you also don't want to not find it when it was there. <laughs> Those are terrible scenarios. So, so in my case, I said to my advisor, wait a minute. Yes, there's this anti-neutron mode. I want to do the one with just a proton. And that way, uh, if I find the proton mode and I find the anti-neutron mode, uh, I know that it's there, but if I only find the anti-neutron the anti -neutron mode and don't find the, if I find one or the other, that's going to be weird because they should be about the same probability anyways. And that's what happened. I did find both modes, and so the reconstruction, the paper that was published, was uh, both modes. Of course, the anti-neutron mode only had half as many uh, of the sample of the particles because it only took care of one conjugate mode, and the proton mode had double because it had all the charged particles. So, and then the linkage to stamp collecting goes with the coins. In stamp, people say, oh, particle physics, experimental particle physics, is like stamp collecting. And being a stamp collector, I can say, yeah, in some way, the analogy is somewhat there. Uh, because if you go back if I, to the dollar that I was saying, 
you're breaking up this big particle, right, this big particle, and, you know, two, uh, an electron and a positron collide, they create some sort of a virtual photon, then it decays into a B meson, and it's, con it's, it's, uh, it's antiparticle, and then that B meson immediately decays into a bunch of stuff. So it's a lot like a postal rate. When you have an envelope, the rate, if you have, if the rate is a dollar, you can put a one dollar stamp, you can put two fifty cent stamps, you can have put four twenty five cent stamps. Modes of these particles, where their particle is so heavy and it decays to like a hundred different combinations of things, are a lot like postal rates. And so when you look at these tables when they're published, there's just mode after mode after mode after mode. B meson to D star other stuff. B meson to D other stuff. B meson to proton, antiproton, etc. So all these different modes. So the B meson, which is a very heavy particle, has like a hundred measured modes. So that takes care of that. Second point is that uh, I had a pretty good work ethic during my PhD. So I, I cleared the whole thing about what your advisor assigns and what do you do about it. Make sure that you know what you're doing. You do your, your what I call your due diligence. And uh, so because I had, I had a job between my bachelor's and my PhD and my master's and my PhD, I had a pretty good work ethic. So I actually worked nine to five steady for five years and I worked a few hours every Sunday night. And that really helped because I saw a lot of grad students who would take six months off, would take a summer off, uh, would slack, would work at all kinds of hours. And that really, uh, I think in some cases, gave them a low performance, whereas in my case, I just had a high yield because I was in there like a, like a business worker. Uh, another thing that, really, that was really helpful was I learned from uh, a couple of other graduate students, especially one who was senior to me and knew a ton, I profited a lot. So that's something that if you do a PhD, it's gonna help you to make some friends who are more senior in what you're doing or something near it, and they're gonna help you as well because your advisor sometimes is just not gonna have the time. And also, it doesn't help to have a, a wider range of people who you talk to who give you ideas about what you're doing. So I recommend that for anybody who does a PhD. Also, uh, have ideas about what you're researching and other topics as well. So what happens, so figure out is, is, is your topic a dud? You know, make sure that you know whether your topic is a dud or not. And if it is, make sure that you have something that's a good backup so you only lose like one year of research uh, and then you still get your PhD and you still, you still do something that you enjoy. Um, then, uh, of course, the thing, the thing that's also people ask, you know, when you leave the field, uh, the decision to leave, uh, the thing that happens in academia and PhDs, and I think this happens to pretty much every PhD program that there is, is the number of PhDs that are minted vastly outnumbers the number of faculty positions that are available. Not postdocs because everybody needs a postdoc as an underpaid, you know, you're making, you're making McDonald's wages often to be a postdoc uh, or food service, as I should call it. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so, so one thing that happens is nobody ever, and, and you know, I'm married, so if you, if you know about married people, nobody ever is sitting there about to get married and says, you know, in two years I'm not going to be married, or in three years I'm not going to be married. Everybody thinks they're going to be married forever. Everybody who goes into a PhD, to some extent, needs to be committed to the field to work very hard and think, well, maybe someday I can be faculty, you know? And that does help psychologically for you to do your work. I mean, it's gonna suck for somebody to do a PhD and to think every day of that PhD, oh, there's no way I'm staying in this field, I'm just gonna quit uh, after I get my PhD. But that's what most people do. Most people just get their PhD and go off, work in information technology, uh, work in some lab, uh, for profit. Sometimes they get a government uh, lab job, but, uh, you know, there, there's, there are many opportunities, and so the good news is, yes, you did a PhD in something, you're not going to use it, you're not going to be faculty, you're not going to be a postdoc, what do you do? Well, you, get, you often get a well-paid job, and often people are like, wow, you got a PhD in physics, That's, we need somebody with uh, skills. You know, you know differential equations, you know linear algebra, uh, you know enough calculus, 
So you're going to be useful to uh, many technical fields. And so there's nothing to despair uh, for somebody to do a PhD in a hard science, or com especially computer science these days, uh, and then go just get a job somewhere. And uh, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, yes, I could rant about string theory, but uh, I don't know. Maybe that's just something that I'll do someday when I'm bored. Uh, but yeah, I did not know what I was getting into uh, when I did the PhD in physics, but I had a lot of fun. And the question that anybody could ask me is, would you do it again knowing what you know now that you spent the rest of your life not doing particle physics? And I would say, yeah, it's pretty rare to do something that's very interesting. Uh, it's very rare to feel like you're at the boundary of a field. So, for example, uh, the only people who, uh, who had done at the time uh, what's called an exclusive reconstruction, that is, reconstruct all the subparticles that make up that B, that B mess on that dollar, if you want to think of it as a coin. Uh, there were very few people who had done that, and so it's kind of interesting, and it's probably still today that number is small, to be in a small company uh, of people who've gotten that far to the boundary of a field. It's pretty cool to be there, to be doing that. And uh, you can take it for, I mean, I've taken it for the rest of my life, and it's fun. It's something that I can say, hey, I did it. I was there. Uh, yeah. So anyways, hit me in the comments. Uh, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be making one of these every week, because this is a math channel, and we're going to be doing a lot of linear algebra uh, for the next few months, and maybe uh, longer. And so, but every now and then, if somebody has some good ideas for uh, a video for my uh, years in physics, which weren't that many, I'll tell you more.